Priscilla Shire Bible study starts with Miss Fanny. The books are $15 a piece. So if you're interested in participating in that, please see Miss Fanny. And that is February 2nd at 3 o'clock here at the church. And it'll be in the multi it'll be in the movie theater that we have. Many of you don't know we have a movie theater in the room next door. So I'd love for you to participate in that. She would love for you to participate in that. And then also, too, there will be a men's gathering this coming Saturday at 5 o'clock. And it'll be here at the church. So come out for that as well. Sweet Pea, you want to come up one second? You want to grab one of those? Yeah, one of those. Just grab one of those and turn it on. Good. Say, so we love you, First Lady. Good afternoon. I just want to encourage everybody as we, we have one more week left in this fast. And as a body, as New Life Deliverance, me and Pastor, we go hard, okay? We want what God has got for us. They are a lot of hurting people in this world. And if we don't step to the plate, then those people are going to be left behind. Each and every one of us have a gift inside of us. And if we don't get on our knees before God, God cannot talk to us and he cannot let us know what he needs us to do what we have been birthed to do we've not been birthed to get up and go to work every day and go out to eat on friday and saturday no that's just some of the benefits that god's laid before us the our plan for our life is to help others, to show others that are hurting, that need God, that the people that have been saved by God, they are gifted, and we need to get out there, and we need to do what God has called us to do. So this week, we have seven days left, y'all. Get, get In the morning time, get up early. Make it a point. God wants to use each and every one of us. But if you don't want to be used, that's fine. He will use someone else, I promise. But they are benefits to being used by God. So when he calls you, listen, answer, because they are great things because you have a gift on the inside of you. And when you go before people and you never know what people's going through and the things that you've gone through, you can use to help somebody else get out of where the enemy has got them. Because you know what? My son is sitting in prison right now, but you know what? The enemy thinks that he is going to keep him in prison. But in the name of Jesus, God is working on him every time. Every time we go see him, I can see a change. I can see life on the inside of him. And I believe with everything on the inside of me that he will stand before you within God's timing and that he will be here and that he will travel around the world with me and pastor because that's what God has called us to do. Go reach the nations and he will be with us. I promise you that. So this week, I ask that you send up a special prayer request for my son because he will come home. I know it. I promise you this. Because God is not a liar. He's got him there for a reason. Yes, he did make some mistakes, but God is training him up. And he is building him up because there are work for him to do. So we just thank God in the name of Jesus that he saved my son, that he put him aside, and that he's got him in the potter's house. So I just thank you for taking that time to pray for my son. Because when he comes home, he's going to stand before you, and we're going to thank you guys once again for bringing him home. Because the God, God in heaven is going to do it. And I just encourage you this week to go hard for Jesus. Push back the soda, push back the going out to eat and get before God and let him show you what he wants you to do this year and for the rest of your life. And we thank you and I encourage you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Y'all wouldn't have a pastor if it wasn't for her. I'm telling you. Y'all would not. Stand, stand to your feet if you will. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to dive into my assignment. Thank you, sweet pea. I love you. Outside the Holy Ghost, you're my greatest encourager. She's my greatest cheerleader. Got five people. In, if I have five people in the congregation, she'll be clapping her hands saying, Hercules, Hercules, Hercules. I'm your Hercules, baby. God be the glory. But as she says, we're getting ready in this fast. Go hard. Go hard. Okay, go hard. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's dive into the word. Verse 17. <clears throat> Many of you know it by heart. I'm going to read it, and after that, we're going to read it together. Therefore, if any man in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 
Now, if you can, let's read it together. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, I want you to read it. Therefore, one more time just together. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I know, Lord, that it's not by might, nor by power, but by your spirit. I know, Lord, that you've said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of your mouth. You said, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And you've also said, God, that if we seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, then all those other things will be added unto us. Speak to us in a way we can understand it. Transform us, renew us, change us, Lord. We love you, God. We adore you, we exalt you. We magnify you, Lord. There's nobody like you. In Jesus' name we pray. And if you're in agreement with that, say amen. amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Tap your neighbor one more time and say, my God is bad to the bone. He's bad to the bone. Hallelujah. <clears throat> to God be the glory. There's an interesting passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus is inquiring of the disciples and he asks them, he says, whom do men say that I am? And it's interesting because <clears throat> the response that he gets from them, he says that, some of them say, they say, well, some say that you are John the Baptist. Some say that you're Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Some say that you are Elijah. But then Jesus asks them and he says, but whom do you say that I am? <clears throat> See, it's not really important who Jesus is to other people. What it boils down to at the end of the day is who Jesus is to you. In other words, just because grandma was saved and spoke in tongues and read the Bible and attended church every Sunday... That doesn't mean you're going to go to heaven. Because it's very, very possible for you to be in church and not be in Christ. It's, better, it's very, very possible for you to come to an assembly and never have really come to Jesus. That's a big difference. Amen? But when he asked the disciples, he said, whom do men say that I am? They go and they give these things. But he says, but whom do you say that I am? And I love Peter's response. He says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus says, Blessed art thou, son of Barjonas, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then he goes on to say, Upon this rock, upon this teaching, upon this truth, I will build my church and the what? The gates of hell. The gates of hell. Hallelujah. I'm glad y'all been reading the word. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And if I was to, typically, if I was to go to this church and interview each and every one of you, I would probably get a different response if it came to that question, Who is Jesus to you? Some of you, you would tell me that with tears in your eyes, you would say, Jesus is my healer. Jesus is my healer. And I would ask you, i say, why, why do you say Jesus is your healer? You would probably tell me that there was a time in your life you had a sickness or a disease or a cancer or a diabetes or, or some kind of illness over your life. And the doctor said that you would never make it. The doctor said that the tumor would never disappear. But you believed God and you stepped out on faith and you prayed and you sought his face and you stood on his word and God began to heal your body. And when they told you that you had six months to live, here you are six years later standing strong and you know that if it had not been for the Lord on your side, where would you be? And you would testify that he's my healer. As anybody in here can testify that he's your healer. Hallelujah. Some of you I would talk to and I would say, who is Jesus to you? You would look at me with tears in your eyes and you would say, he's my deliverer. I would ask you, why do you say he's your deliverer? You would tell me that there was a time that you was bound, that you was locked up. The time that they took the key and they threw it away. They locked you up. They put you behind bars. Maybe you wasn't behind physical bars, but maybe you were behind some kind of addiction, some kind of bondage, some kind of stronghold. Maybe it was crack. Maybe it was meth. Maybe it was Xanaxes. Maybe it was some kind of drug. Maybe some kind of uh, heroin. Whatever it was, it was on your life. But now, you, now because you are in Christ Jesus, Christ has delivered you and he set you free. And with tears in your eyes, you would say, he's my deliverer. As you look back to the portfolio in your mind, you would think of times that you were incarcerated. You would think of times when you were rejected and you were despised. And you could say, he's my deliverer. And I would say, why is he your deliverer? You would be able to say, I was thinking about suicide and he delivered me. I was thinking about, I, I was so low in my life, I didn't see a way out. And Jesus stepped in and he set me free. I didn't think like this. I didn't live like this. I hadn't always smelt this good or looked this good or dressed this good or drive this good. I haven't been in this situation 
all my life, but I have to say that Jesus is my deliverer. Some of you would say that Jesus is my provider. And I would ask you, how do you know that he's your provider? You would look at me with tears in your eyes and you would say, he is Jehovah Jireh. Because there was a time in my life that I didn't have no food. And but God provided for me food. Not only food for me, but food for my whole entire household. There was a time when I didn't have a job. Nobody didn't want to hire me. Even I wouldn't hire me, but he made a way. And I can say he's a provider. Some of you would say that he's a way maker. How is he a way maker? Because there was a time in my life when my back was against the wall and I did not have anywhere to go, but Jesus is a way maker. Can anybody testify in this place today that he is a way maker, that he is a barrier break, that he is the God that can break every yoke and every stronghold off an individual's life? That's a good place to give God praise in the house. So we would all say something different. Some of us would say he's the lifter of our head because there was a time we were in depression. Some of us would say that he's, I love what David does because David, what he does is he's so ecstatic about God. What he does is he says, the Lord is my rock and my sword and my shield and my buckler and my fortress and my strong tower. He's my light and he's my salvation. And he prepares the table before me in the presence of my, he goes into this tirade, uh, this tirade of just how good God has been to him. And he begins to expose all these things out of his mouth. God has been so good to me. Hallelujah. Some of you would say he's my redeemer, he's my king, he's my lord, he's my God. He's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. When my family forsake me, mama and dad left me, the Lord took care of me. He's the God that supplies all my needs. He is the God of all comfort because there was a time I was in mourning. There was a time I was in loss. There was a time I was in grieving. But God began to comfort me with his presence and with his power and with his touch. Can anybody just testify that he's a comforter? Can anybody testify that he's a healer? Can anybody testify that he's the deliverer? Can anybody Anybody testify that he's a healer? Can anybody testify that he's a way maker? Can anybody just testify that he's done something for you that you could not do for yourself? Somebody give him a praise in the house. So we would all have something different to say. But what I've discovered in life is that the most important thing that you believe is what you believe about God. This is why the enemy will always attack the word. This is why the enemy will always attack truth. This is why the enemy will always attack life sources. He'll always attack the life source, a spiritual life source. He'll always do that because he does not want you to believe correctly. See, because, listen, you'll never live right if you think wrong. You will never live right if you think wrong. And you will never be defeated by what other people say about you. You'll only be defeated by what you say about you. It's about what you say about you. So then I submit to you, then the very first, the, the very important thing that you need to believe is what you believe about God. What, the facts that you believe about God is the most important thing. But second to that is what you believe about yourself. What do you believe about yourself? And the reason I wanted to launch this, launch from this passage of scripture, because so many times we are basing our theology and we're basing our convictions and we're basing our stance and our livelihood as Christians as based upon denominationalism and based upon regurgitated ideas that are not really scriptural. But the Bible says this, that if anybody is in Christ, then they are a new creature. Not if anybody is in a denomination, not if anybody is in church. I told you that it's very possible for you to be in church, but not in Christ. See, there's three basic positions. Either when you were without Christ, you were lost, dead in your trespasses and sins. Now you get saved and you are in Christ, and which, is, which is grace. But then eventually you'll be with Christ, which is glory. See, what I want you to understand as a Christian, this is so important. And this is why I believe that so many of us, we live in defeat and we live in agony. We live in frustration and we live in despair. Is because we really haven't tapped into the reality of what it means to be a new creation. The word creation there, the word new means an unused vessel, but the word creation means uh, basically return back to the original formation. Return back to the original formation. So if you think about the Bible and the way that it's written, it starts off with Adam. And the Bible teaches us in the book of Romans, it said that when Adam sinned, then death came into the world and death passed into all mankind. The Bible says that Adam himself, it says in Corinthians, that Adam was the natural man. But Jesus is the, super, is, is, is the spiritual. So we have the first Adam and we have the last Adam. It's very important for you to understand. Now all of us here, 
we were in the first Adam in the sense that we were born into the world. You remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3? He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he said, he said this, Except a man be born again, he shall not enter the kingdom of God. He shall not see the kingdom of God. So listen very carefully. And I've taught this for you. I've taught this before. But I want you to get this principle. If you're born twice, you die once. But if you're born once, you die twice. Now let me, let me explain this to you. If you're born once of just of the Adamic nature, of the Adamic birth, then you die twice. You die twice. How do you die twice? You die the first death, which is a physical death, and then you die the second death, which is a spiritual death. Because the Bible says this. The Bible says, And whosoever's name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. So the first death that you have is the natural death. The second death you have is the spiritual death. That's if you are not, that's if you are not in Christ. If you are only in Adam, you've only been born of the flesh and you haven't been born of the spirit. That's why you have to be born of the spirit. And when you are born of the spirit, now what happens is you are born again. So now, you've, now you have two births. You have a physical birth and you have a spiritual birth. Every year I get my wife to take me out twice. We go out to eat on my physical birthday, and we go out to eat on my spiritual birthday. We celebrate that day because I've been born twice. Somebody shout glory. I can go back to the day. I can go back to the time. I can go back to the place. Something happened on the inside of me, and I can put my finger on it. But now that I've been born twice, I only die once. In the sense of I only die the physical death. But my last breath here will be my first breath there. But I am a new creature. Now, the reason why I wanted to lay that backdrop is because as a Christian, I am a new creation. Now, you have to understand that. The Bible says this. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. So if I am a new person, that means that I am not tied to the biological lineage that I had in the Adamic line. My God, this is good. In other words, my father was an idolater. My father's father was an idolater in India because they made gods. They made golden gods. That's what they did in India. You made, if you go to India, they have 350 million gods. It's unreal. Everywhere you go, they have little idols and temples. And they, but when you're there in India and you're a, a goldsmith, you make gods. And so that's what his family did. My mother was a Muslim before she got saved. Somebody shout glory. But she was a Muslim, so she had an Islamic background. So my background was Hinduism and Islam. And so, but now what's happened is I've come into Christ. And as a result of that, I'm no longer tied to any of the baggage behind me. But I'm set free because all things have become new. Now, this is where it gets a little complicated because in the Old Testament, it says that God will bless those that love him and to the thousands of generations, but unto those that hate him and to the thousands of generations, unto the third and fourth generation. So a generation is 40 years. So potentially a generational curse then could have lasted between, between uh, what, third and fourth generations. So that's basically 120 to 160 years. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and in Exodus chapter 20. But now, because I'm not in the Old Testament anymore and I'm not under that old covenant the children's teeth are not set on edge because the fathers have ate grapes I'm under a new thing a new covenant and now I have a new I have I'm, I'm, a, I'm a new creature and I don't identify myself with anything that's behind me anymore in other words if mama died of diabetes that don't that don't apply to me if, if daddy died of cancer that don't apply to me I want you to understand this because so often times we 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 can connect with different doctors and things like that and, and the Bible says that the physician that, that those that are sick need a physician so Jesus never said anything about doctors God bless the doctors and the ones that serve but what I, want, I want you to understand is that there's a reality that you can step to in scripture and where you can be able to say and be so confident that you are not of the root of your family but now you're of the root of Jesse you're not of the you're not you're, you're, you're not of that tribe anymore but now you're of the tribe of the lion of the tribe of Judah now you, you, you you've cut you've severed yourself away from those things because you understand now that you are a new creature in other words I don't have to lock myself in a closet repenting of generational sins for five hours I don't have to do that if I understand the scriptures where I step into the reality of being a new creation now in my immaturity as a believer yeah of course I'll douse myself with oil where I look like the Crisco kid put the prayer shawl on and pray for 20 hours like Daniel might have did in the Old Testament when he confessed the sins of his fathers and Jeremiah confessed the sins of his fathers but in 
the New Testament, I have no point of reference to do that. And I can't just mimic what I see people do on YouTube. I've got to draw what I've got to out of the scripture and step into the reality that the curse is broken. The Bible says in the book of Galatians, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree and Jesus became a curse for me. So how do I have a, oh my God, how do I, how can I walk in a generational curse if the curse has been broken? Somebody needs to get excited about this. So let me make it a little more practical. If daddy was an alcoholic, it stops here. Bah! If mama was a whoremonger, it stops here. It's broken right here. As soon as I entered into Christ, all, the Bible says all things have passed away. Did it say all things but bloodlines? Did it say all things but generational curse? No, it says all things. All means all. He said all things. And what happens is I become a new formation. And not with the Adamic nature, but with the, with the Christ nature. Because now I'm in Christ. 160 times in the New Testament, it says in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ. I'm in Christ. So you have to understand this. So when God looks at me, he sees Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? The Bible says the hope of glory in you, which is Christ, the hope of glory. He's inside of me. I'm the temple of God. I'm, I'm the temple of God. I don't have to say, I don't have to, I don't have to invite God into a room. He's, I'm, I, he's, he's already here when I stepped in. You got what I'm saying? But what I want you to understand, church, is that oftentimes we live in so much defeat because we're still identifying with the old and not with the new. In other words, like there's certain programs, and there's some great programs out there that are in the world. They're great programs. But they'll tell you that once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. They'll tell you once a drug addict, always a drug addict. Well, if you say that, then what you're doing is you're contradicting what the Bible is teaching. And you can hang on to that to justify where you are in your head. But what I want you to know that there's a reality. See, the new creation is a reality that the believer has to accept by faith and begin to walk in. It can't be something that you can articulate only through your mouth. But it has to be such a heartfelt reality in your spirit where you begin to walk in it. In other words, I know that I am the chosen of the Lord. I know that I am the blessed of the Lord. I know that I am the ordained of the Lord. I know that there are certain things that God has given to me and on the inside of me. I don't have to worry about Ouija boards. I don't have to worry about sorcerers and hexes and people trying to put roots on you. I found dead chickens in the parking lot before. Who they think they playing? That ain't going to mess with us. You can cut the chickens up all you want to and sprinkle the blood and do all that ain't going to hurt us. Why? Because we are of a new creation. And the thing is that we are in Christ. And the Bible says that God has given us all authority over the devil. I ain't got to lock myself in the bedroom just because I heard my refrigerator door open at 3 o'clock in the morning. I can step out and say in the name up Jesus you have no place to be up in here and I can go right back to sleep somebody needs to give God a praise in this place I ain't worried about nobody putting a hex I ain't worried about nobody putting a spell I ain't worried about nobody running up on me with a monkey's foot and scratching me on the back I ain't worried about none of that stuff because I'm covered in the blood with the blood of Jesus and I'm bought with a price I am not my own but so often we don't step into that reality we don't step into that reality. And God's will for us in 2019 is that, because, is that to become so much of a reality to you. I told the first service about flu. People come, people, the flu is around and the cold is around. And, and you don't want to shake people's hands because you got the cold. How do you think that you're going to defeat cancer if you're scared of a little flu? That was good right there. You have to get in your spirit, so, so embedded in your spirit. That you move from the place where you're moving from healing to healing, but you're walking in divine health. And then when you walk, you say, a thousand shall fall my right and ten thousand my left, but it shall not come nigh me. The angel of the Lord encampeth about those that fear him. I have a covering with Almighty God. I belong to God and he watches over me. He protects me. He is my Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides. He is my Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals. He is the God that desires me to prosper and be in good health. Even as my soul prospers, I can call upon him and he will answer me and he will show me great and mighty things that I know it's not. I hear. He is the God that has my back and my front. So people come to and say, don't shake my hand, Pastor, I got the flu. You need to shake my hand because I ain't worried about what's on you getting on me. You need to get some on me. What's on you? You got what I'm saying? Now, if you got runny snot all over your hands and everything and dried up boogers on the back, I ain't shaking your hand. And I'm looking to you best believe. Because you got some people like... 
I love you, Pastor. I love you too. Hallelujah. Security. Be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Hallelujah. But there's a reality that we step into. The reality that we step into is that I am salt, that I am light. The reality that I step into is that I'm the elect of God, that I am the chosen of God, that I am ordained of God, that I am the blessed of God, that I am, that, that, that I am the glorified of God, that I am the set apart one of God, that I am a king and that I am a priest. That's, what, that's my identity in the scriptures. Listen. If the, if the devil can confuse you about your identity, the devil can confuse you about your future. Did you hear what I said? If the devil, if the enemy can confuse you about your identity, he can confuse you about your future. Some of you, you're trying to cast out demons and all this stuff, and you don't even know who you are yet. If you don't even know who you are, how do you expect the demons to know who you are? Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Only when you know who you are. My God, Rabasa. Only when you only when you know who you are, I know who I am. I know that I'm the beloved of the Lord. I know that I am accepted in the blood. I know I like people clapping for me, but even if they don't clap, I'm accepted by Jesus. I know, I, I, I know that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Some of you you look in the mirror and you're saying, Well, I'm too wide, or I'm too short, or I'm too big, or I'm too this, and I'm too that, and, and, you, and, you, and you try to put all this cream on that you didn't bought and try to tighten stuff up on your face and, and Botox and all that stuff. And the thing about it is, is you just got to get to the place where you say, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You look in the mirror and you just say, boy, you look good today. Hallelujah. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. The Bible says that God has designed us in such a way. But so many times we don't see ourselves as God sees us. And as a result, we live in defeat. As a result, we live in lack. As a result, we live, we, we live in a place of anxiety. Do you know the Bible says that God always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus? Think about that. God always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. In other words, you throw me in the pit, I'm coming to the top. You throw me in the ocean, I'm coming to the top. It always causes us to triumph. No matter what we do with the wisdom of God and the right counsel and all that understanding, having that reality on the inside of you, you wake up in the morning and, you, and your foot hits the ground. You say, I cannot fail. Can God fail? The God, the God of the universe, the one who took the stars and threw them into the velvet night, the one who calls them all by name, the one who said, I've engraved you in the palm of my hand. He said, even though a mother may forsake her suckling child, I, the Lord, will never forsake you. This God, he lives on the inside of you. Oh, he lives on the inside of you. He's on the inside of me. So you live from that place of power. You live from that place of anointing. You live from that place of destiny. You live from that place of purpose. When the doctor tells you you got a sickness and you ain't got long to live, you just laugh. <laughs> oh man, I can't wait to get the testimony on this one. Hallelujah, because God is going to turn it around. When people leave you out your life, you say, <laughs> man, you're going to miss out. Hallelujah. Uh, look for me you'll find me at the top because cream always rises there because God always causes me to triumph see the thing about the scriptures is God tells me that I'm not a conqueror he says he, he doesn't say I'm a conqueror he says I'm more than a conqueror so how can I live in defeat I can only live in defeat if I think defeat I can only live in lack if I think lack I can only live in fear if I think fear. I can only live in trepidation if I think trepidation. There comes a time in your life, in your walk with God, where you stop depending upon preachers to feed you and YouTube to feed you and TD Jakes to feed you. There comes a time as a believer where you crack open another word and you say, God, tell me who I am, God. Tell me who I am, God. And God says you're beloved. God says you're accepted. God says that you're ordained. God says that you're chosen. God says that you're elected. God says that you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. I ain't got to be busted, disgusted, and can't be trusted. I ain't got to walk around on my head all down. I lift my eyes to the hill from whence coming my help. My help comes from the Lord who's made heaven and earth. I can't get no help up in here, but I wish somebody would give God a praise. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. I think about my life, church, before the cross. I think about my life being in addictions. I think about my life being an alcohol. I think about my life being in sexual immorality and all that stuff. 
All that dark stuff that I was in wasn't living right for God. My heart was dark, dark, dark heart. I told the first service, y'all better be glad I'm saved. Because if I wasn't saved, I'd be breaking in your cars while y'all in church right now. But I, my heart was so dark. It was so dark. On cocaine and on meth and on pills and on acid and on all these different things and crime and lawlessness and, and hatred and, and rage and all this stuff in my heart and lying and envy and all this strife in my heart. But then I got in Christ. And when that happened, old things were passed away. I don't identify with my ethnicity anymore. You got what I'm saying? Because old things have passed away. The Bible says there's neither Jew, nor Greek, nor circumcision, or uncircumcision, or bond, nor free, but in all in Christ. It's all absolved in Christ. It's all passed away. What they did is passed away. Everything's behind me. Everything's forward from the cross on. And as I got into the word, I began to see that, that we are transformed. Listen, listen to this. You're not transformed by salvation. You are transformed by the renewing of your mind. Y'all read that in the Bible? Salvation is the catalyst. But you have many people that are saved but ain't transformed. Oh my God, that's good. But how do you do that? You get into God's word. And God begins to reveal to you. And when he, when he says that you are chosen and that you are elected. Don't pull out a dozen commentaries and try to say, well, God, how am I? If I'm chosen and I'm elected, then well, how come I just not a, just a low down sinner saved by grace? The Bible never says that about the redeemed person. Do you know that? You know, I've been to Africa, I've been to India, I've been to all different kind of places of the world. My wife and I and the teams, we went casting out demons and all that stuff, blah, 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 all that stuff. We did all that stuff. The worst demon is a religious demon. I'd rather deal with a demon in Africa any day than a demon, than a religious demon. The religious demon said, we good. Leave us alone. We all right. Our four no more. We content. We, do, we always do it this way. You are not what they say you are. The Bible says that if the righteous be scarcely saved. Are you saved? Are you saved? Then you're righteous. Wave at me. The Bible says he who knew no sin became sin so you can become the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. So you're righteous because of what Christ did, not because of anything you've done. The Bible says that the righteous be scarcely saved, then where shall the sinner and ungodly appear? Y'all remember reading that in the Bible? Yes. David said it like this, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So there is a direct divide between somebody who is saved and somebody who is lost. And the word for somebody who is lost is a sinner. Are y'all getting this? It's in the word. I promise you, it's in the word. Those that are lost, that's what they're called. They're sinners. They're lost. They're, they're blind. The, 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 the Bible says that they're alienated from the hope of God. That's what they are. The Bible says that they're dead in their trespasses and sins. That's what the Bible describes them. But the way that God describes you as a blood-bought believer, he describes you as his son and as his daughter and as kings and as priests. And once you begin to realize that in your life, everything will begin to change. Do y'all believe that? And you can't just say it from your mouth. It has to be so embedded in your spirit, man. A lot of us, we're saying stuff out of our mouth that our heart doesn't even believe. And it has to come from here. As a man thinketh in his heart, not as a man speaketh with his mouth, but as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Stand to your feet all around the house. 
I believe that's a good place to put your hands together and give God a praise for the word. So you know what that means then? If that's a reality to you, and you're walking in light, and you're walking in love, and you're walking under the sub subjection of God's word, that means you can't fail. My God, that's good. He always causes us to triumph. I can make a, I, I, I can, I can start a hot dog stand tomorrow, and it'll prosper. Boom. I see stand, it'll prosper. Boom. Always causing me to triumph. But oftentimes we don't live like it. And I believe the Lord says, hey, let's get this identity thing together. You're a new creature. Let the new creation reality, that truth, become that reality in your life when you're walking in it. So let me show you what that looks like. I wake up in the morning. As soon as my eyes open up, because I know who I am, and I know who I belong to. Demons are jumping out the window saying, oh, hell no, he's up again. My feet hit the floor, and I say, I will bless you, Lord, at all times. Your praise shall continually be in my mind. And as I'm walking, the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. Present, continuous state. In other words, I can't think, I can't think victory, I can't think victory at 135 and then think defeat at 5 o'clock. You got what I'm saying? But I've got the, it's a present continuous state. God, you said I'm victorious. You said I'm the head. And I'm walking through my day. God, you said I'm the head and not the tail. God, you said I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed in my going in. I'm blessed in my going out. You said you'll give me houses I didn't build. Wells I didn't dig. Vineyards I didn't plant. You said, God, that you're going to cause all things to work together for my good. God, you said, Lord, that the angels of the Lord encampeth about those that fear him. God, you said in your word, God, that the good man's steps are ordered by the Lord. God, you said in your word, God, that you're going to provide all my need according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God, you said in your word, God, that I am a king, that I am a priest, that I am ordained, that I am an ambassador, that I am accepted. I know they left me, God, but I'm accepted by you, God. Even though my father and mother forsake me, God, you're going to watch over me, Lord. God, you said that you will never leave me nor forsake me, God. My eyes are fixed upon Jesus, looking at the author and finisher of our faith, laying aside every weight and every sin that so easily besets me. God, I know that I'm holy. I know that I'm righteous. I know that I'm set apart. I know that I'm sanctified. I know, God, that I'm blessed. I know that I have favor. As I look back, God, goodness and mercy are following me all the days of my life. You prepare a table before me. It's coming into that reality that the old is gone and that the new is here. I don't know who had not been thinking right, but if that's you, you need to come and hit this altar. If you hadn't been thinking right, come and hit this altar right now and say, God, I hadn't been thinking right. I've been thinking of defeat. I've been thinking of defeat, God. But I can't end like this, Lord. God, I don't have peace, Lord. Because my mind hadn't been stayed on you. Will you come? Come on, sister, will you come? <clears throat> will you come? You've been living out the Adamic. And you have not been living out of Christ. I have new ways now about me. The Adamic nature, I'd go upside your head in a second. I got a new nature. I have a new nature now. Do you understand? What have you been living out of? Have you been living out of the Adamic? Or you've been living out of Christ? Will you come? More of you need to be at this altar. Come on. Will you come? Will you come? And what God wants you to do is just agree with Him. Just saying, God, I agree with you, Lord, about my situation now. That I am the head and not the tail. Will you come? Come on, young man. Hallelujah. Will you come? Are there some others that come? If you're under the sound of my voice and you have not been living for God, you need to agree with God. God, my heart ain't right with you. God's okay with that. He's okay with you saying, God, my heart's not right with you. But it has to go further than that where you have to say, God, I'm getting right with you today. I'm giving you my heart. 
I'm giving you my life. If that's you, being saved is so simple. It's you coming saying, God, I'm a sinner. I recognize I'm lost. I recognize that I've broken your law. I recognize, I recognize that if I die today that I, I would go to hell and not to heaven. And I've broken your law, God, and I've broken your heart. And as I'm here before you, God, I need you to save my soul. I repent. I turn my back, God. I turn my back on the world, the flesh, and the devil, God. And I give you my heart the best way I know how. If that's you and you want to say that prayer, wherever you are, raise your hand. Can you wave, it, wave at me wherever you are? If you're here today and you have never said that prayer, will you come? I'd love to pray for you. Don't let the devil talk you out of it. Will you come? Be bold enough to come and say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it right. When I first got saved, I remember I, I gave my life to Christ in the jail cells. I look back over my life. But I remember going to chapel services in prison. And every time they'd have the altar call, I'd come down, I'd come down, I'd come down. And preachers love when people come down. And I remember going down about the 10th time and somebody pulled me to the side and said, I think you finally got it. I said, praise the Lord. I want to make sure I got it. Hallelujah. I want to make sure I got it. And if that's you, will you come? We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to introduce you to the King of Kings. You can't change yourself. You can't change yourself. You don't have the ability to do it. Some people say, well, pastor, I got to stop doing such and such and then I'll give my life to God. Well, waiting for you to, for you to wait to stop doing such and such is the equivalent of waiting to stop bleeding before you go to the emergency room. You go to the emergency room and they'll fix you up. They might charge you $20,000, but they'll fix you up. To come to Christ and say, God, I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you my mind. I want Christ in me. I want to be in Him. Is there anybody else? I'm agreeing with God about my finances. I'm agreeing with God about my life. I'm agreeing with God about my future. I'm agreeing with God. I'm agreeing with God. That's all He's looking for. There's somebody to agree with Him. I agree with Him that I'll never, that I won't continue to stay in the place that I am. I agree with God for my healing. I hear that in the Holy Ghost. Somebody saying, I hear the Lord saying, somebody needs to agree with him about their healing. That's all he's looking for, for you to agree with him. Stop agreeing with the doctors. Stop agreeing with the numbers. Stop agreeing with the, with the graphs and the charts and the x-rays and the CAT scans. Stop agreeing with that. God said, agree with me. I am the God that healeth thee. Some of you, you are walking in depression. You need to agree with God. That he'll give you a garment of praise in exchange for a cloak of heaviness. Will you come? We're going to have ministry time here at the altar. If anybody wants to respond, you're welcome to. But for the remainder of you, did y'all enjoy that word? Yeah. Amen. Throw your hands to the heavens. Repeat after me. Say, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I come to you. And I realize... That there are times in my life where I was not agreeing with you. But from this day forward, I pray that you never let me forget. Let you be true and every man a liar. I stand on your word and I agree with you for healing, for provision, for salvation, for protection, for wisdom for direction, for favor, for blessing, for promotion, for my inheritance and my portion. I receive it today by faith in the name of Jesus. Rekindle my hunger for your word. Show me what you see in me. I love you and I thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, y'all can do better than that. Come on, put your hands together one more time. I believe that was a good word. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Y'all may be dismissed. Go in peace, go in power, go in love. And as you're being dismissed, tap somebody on the shoulder and say, he makes all things new. He makes all things new. Thank you for coming out. Y'all were a great crowd today. Blessings.